every blessing. Hallelujah. For this, I, I give you praise. For every mountain, every last living one of them, trials and tribulations, Say hallelujah. honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Dr. Gloria Tate, uh, Chair of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Michael Battle, President of ITC, to the various presidents of the seminaries that make up the Interdenominational Theological Center, to those who have been honored and conferred with honorary degrees today especially my Episcopal father in the ministry, Bishop John Hurst Adams, and Dr. James Cone, uh, who was a foundation, uh, whose foundation were guided uh, me through my seminary years. To the distinguished members of the Board of Trustees, to Bishop William P. DeVoe, the presiding prelate of the 6th Episcopal District, to Bishop Henry Allen Beelan and Supervisor Beelan, Praise God for your presence. To my husband, my partner in life and ministry, Supervisor Stan McKenzie. To Presiding Elder Johnson and Mrs. Johnson, who accompanied uh, us from the 13th Episcopal District. To the distinguished faculty and staff. And to this class of 2007. I, I was... Uh, invited and I am listed as the speaker and so I, I brought a speech uh, but I brought my Bible just in case and and so if you will allow me to journey between uh, both genres, right. when I'm preaching, say amen. amen, and when I'm speaking, say mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we want to hang this on uh, the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, All right. All right. Uh, verses 1 through 23, my, my. but I will just lift up uh, the first few from the New International Version. Now the tax collectors and sinners uh -huh. were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the 90 and 9 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and go home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. If we would choose a text, it would be the first portion of verse 4, suppose one of you 
In the King James Version, it says, what man of you? But I like the translation uh, that says, which one of you? Amen. Beloved of God, leadership is an experience that often includes conflicting elements. Yeah. Whether one is elected, appointed, anointed, or a designated hitter in the pulpit, there is always the flip side to leadership. Yeah. On one side, there is the mysterium. On the other, there is the mundane. There is the exceptional, and there is the mediocre. There are those who think they are immortal, and then there's the rest of us. There is the called and the chosen, and the sent and those who just went. They are the wheat and the tares, the good and the evil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Leadership is an experience that often includes conflicting elements. The diversity of the leader experience includes both burden and blessing, in case you haven't figured that out yet. It also includes sunshine and rain, rapture and pain and gain, test and triumphs, uh, testimony, and you have one now, and tribulation, passion, and indifference. Leadership then has both uh, promise, uh, peril, and passion. There is the promise of a better day and the peril of insulated, isolated decisions. There is the promise of peace and the peril of sending a warrior to make peace. There is the promise of intellect and preparation and the peril of head without heart becomes arrogance. There is the promise of courageous solutions and the peril of only one right answer. The promise of significance and the peril of success. The promise of hope and the peril of disappointment. The promise of achieving against great odds and the peril of overconfidence. The promise of opportunity and the peril of wasting your opportunities. Leadership then has promise and peril, but it also has passion. According to authors Jim Coos and Barry Posner, any thought of leadership would, must include the word passion. But passion for most of us means fervor and enthusiasm and zeal and energy and intensity, exuberance or excitement. But when you dig a little deeper into the word passion, yeah. you soon learn that passion comes from the Latin word for suffering. Therefore, to have passion means to suffer. So, a passionate preacher is a preacher who is willing to suffer. And a compassionate preacher is someone who shares in the suffering of someone else. And not only shares in the suffering of your constituency, but you are willing to take action to alleviate their suffering. And Jesus asked the question, which one of you? Thus then, the best leaders are those who suffer the most over their decisions, but still retain their ability to be decisive. And so the tapestry of leadership is woven with paradoxical threads. The truth of the matter is, is that what you are about to do when you leave this institution is hard work. It is not easy, no matter how easy some folk make it look. The higher the level of leadership, the greater the impact your decisions will be. If you are a stock clerk working in the widget company, making a decision and misplace a stock item, that decision could upset one customer, but does not disrupt the supply line or close the store or cause the management to downsize. On the other hand, the stock manager of the Gidget Widget Company may blow a supply and demand decision 
that goes beyond locating a misplaced item because there are no items to misplace, which impacts the business bottom line. Yeah. Then the stock company president makes the decision to put more money into research and development than in production, which causes a drop in production, meaning there is no product available at all to misplace. There is no raw material on hand to make more, no plant time set aside to make, which means a loss of revenue, lost wages, and lost earnings for the stockholder. So the higher up the food chain the leader is, the more impact they have on people and program. How they live and how well they live, the bottom line of a congregation, a family, or a nation. So then leadership is not for the faint of heart. Nor is it for novices or for those who have nothing else to do or no more worlds to conquer. But what scares me the most are the George Jefferson preachers. You know the ones, the ones who were just happy to be here. They just happy that they moved from Archie Bunker's neighborhood to the east side, to the deluxe congregation in the sky. Because they finally got a piece of the pie. Beans don't burn in the kitchen. Fish don't burn on the grill. Took a whole lot of trying just to make it up the hill. Now we're up in the big church. It's our turn it back. As long as you're here, it's you and me, baby. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We need preachers who are not just happy to be here to finally get a piece of the pie. We need leaders, preachers, who know that God has grabbed a hold of them. And God won't let you go, as in something's got a hold of me. Preachers who know what they stand for and not what others tell you to stand for. Preachers who know what they believe and who they believe in and have the ability to act on that belief. Preachers who are passionate compassionates, who knows what makes you suffer, who understand what they really care about, what makes you cry, what makes you jump for joy, and what keeps you up all night long. Preachers who are able to stay focused on the whole as well as the part, the many as well as the few. For here lies the crux of the text. What man of you, suppose one of you, or the one I prefer, which one of you? I don't need to tell you that Luke is the third, uh, uh, the gospel, the synoptic gospel, that presents us a Christ with a universal outlook. I don't need to tell you that. You've been working on that now for a couple of years. <laughs> that this body of holy writ is attributed to Luke, the physician, a scientist, who would look for evidence and details to support his diagnosis of an extraordinary leader by the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> As opposed to Matthew, who carefully wanted to make sure his new converts understood Jesus as the long-expected Messiah, that Matthew was the one who wanted to be sure that he is the one spoken of by the prophets who came not to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill him. And so according to Matthew, we see a Jesus calling us to a greater commitment. In other words, don't just love your uh, neighbor, love your enemy. Uh, 
Uh, don't just pray out for everybody to see you in the street, but get into your prayer closet. Uh, uh, pray for those who act like they like you, and then pray for those who don't, who don't like you at all. And so where Matthew has a preponderance of references uh, to the old covenant, Luke does not rely on a collective Hebrew memory. Luke is appealing to those who are on the outside looking in, a Gentile audience without a Hebrew background to build a bridge to Jesus' Messiahship. You see, I have to act like I've been to seminary so that Howard would just call my name every now and then. It seems similar to our 21st century life where we may have one or two generations without a Sunday school memory. They don't have a Psalm 23 memory. They don't have a Psalm 100 memory. And they cannot sing, yes, Jesus loves me, upon which you can build a bridge to Jesus Christ. And so Luke gives us a Jesus that widens our circle of concern. Old enemies become heroes like the hated and despised Samaritan becomes good outcasts like lepers and the blind are recipients of God's grace. Here is a Jesus who touches the infirm, the lonely, the left out, the least and the less. A Jesus who knows how to hang out with the boys, touches, heals and delivers and can throw down regularly in the temple. What Jesus has then is not just for the privileged few. And isn't that the challenge to you preachers today? That what we have to give and what we contribute and what you give and what you do and what you decide, what you practice or what you put into policy or what you fail to put into policy, what you weigh, what you consider, what you advise, what you risk, where you stand, where you draw the line, how you spend your time, uh, the systems you put in place or don't put in the place, uh, which lives you touch, uh, how you see things uh, through your theological lens uh, is not just for the privilege, uh, but is for everyone. It is hard sometimes uh, keeping a clear head, uh, whether you're in the spotlight or, or caught in the headlight like a, like a deer, uh, in the headlights of politics, administration, uh, government, the academy, the church or denomination, or your convention or behind closed doors. Here it is. One should never take on the responsibility of preaching or pastoral ministry if you are not willing to see beyond your own needs. And Jesus asked, which one of you? Our text is found in the parable of the lost, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Here we find that Jesus uses a coin and a sheep and a son to teach among many things repentance, that the misplace is as important as those who are in place, that the one who wanders away is just as important as the one that stays in the fold. And the one who walks away and wastes their substance is just as important as the faithful who maintain their membership. Yeah. It is also about rejoicing yeah. that when you have found what was lost, yeah. praise the Lord, yeah. that when you retrieve what is misplaced, hallelujah, yeah. or who was misplaced, or when what returns to us what we thought would never return to us in the first place, that's a hallelujah and amen. It is a cause of celebration, but that is not why God brings us to the text. The emphasis is not siding with the sheep coming home on the shoulders of the shepherd. It is not on the coin who is enjoying light after being lost in a dark corner. It is not on the son whom time brought home or the older son who was lost in his own backyard. 
the focus of the text is on the leader. Yeah. And so Jesus asks, uh, suppose, uh, and which one of you? This is directed to his audience according to Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor's take on the text. She says uh, the text is focused on the Pharisees, the disciples, uh, the leaders in the room, uh, the religious establishment, uh, the ones who were supposed uh, to be holy, who took on the mantle of leadership. It was not on the sheep who wandered away, or the coin who was misplaced, or the son who left home, or the parents who were left behind. It is directed to the leaders of the church, of our community, of our denomination, whether that leader is elected, selected, installed, assigned, derailed, assumed, called, or chosen. The question, which one of you, speaks to the substance of our service, the quality and the character of the leader. So, preacher, the question is, which one of you, which one of you what? Which one of you will go the extra mile? This speaks to the compassion the shared in suffering and your willingness to do something about the suffering. It is easy to sit in your churches and wait for sheep to come in. But which one of you is willing to become personally involved, to roll up your sleeves, to come out of your ivory towers, out of the halls of power, out of the citadels of decision, out of the boardrooms of planning and preparation, and become personally involved? This is not a task that you send your officers to do for you. This is a task for you to join in. Yeah. And leadership is about relationship. Yeah. Making them, building them, repairing them, and finding them when, you, when they get lost. Yeah. You can't be scared, amen. Yeah. Understand, oh, you are, you are, you are ebonically challenged. Yeah. You can't be scared. which is different from scared. Yeah. Scared is scared. Everybody gets scared. Scared is a deeper level of scared. So if you're gonna do this thing, you can't be scared. And if you don't like people, you're in the wrong place. Even if loyalties are misplaced, roll up your sleeves. Put your hands on it. Be willing to get on your knees and pick up the flashlight and look for the coin that is lost in the corner where we have lost our dignity and our integrity, our honesty and our character. In the dark places of the 21st century, we must be willing to go and retrieve our children who have been lost and forgotten. We have to go and find our self-esteem that has been shrouded by a consumer culture. Our purpose has been derailed. Our plans have been forgotten. And we must look for the things of value in the 21st century, take them out of the darkness, and bring them into the marvelous light. Which one of you is willing to go the extra mile to retrieve a sense of values in modern living, to tell the children don't buy the hype, go the extra mile to get the sleep deprived, those who are stressed out by events too far away from home and events that are too close. Which one of you is willing to go the extra mile and retrieve the confused, the misled, the picked on, and the picked over? 
to those who like you and those who don't like you, those who agree with you and those who don't. Aha, retrieve our history from this generation so they won't take what is derogatory and make it into something of glory. Which one of you is willing to go the extra mile to retrieve the misplaced and for God's sake sweep the house clean? If anybody's house ought to be clean, our house ought to be clean. Which one of you will do whatever it takes to bring democracy back from overseas and make sure it works here. Which one of you is willing to do whatever is necessary to find what is valuable and hidden and bring it back home? Which one of you, that's the question Jesus asked, and which one of you what? Which one of you is willing to go the extra mile, but which one of you is willing to go out of your way? You want to be a preacher? Then you must be willing to pay the price. Remember, it's blessing and burden. Promise, peril, and passion. By sacrificing, you demonstrate that you are not in this thing for yourself. This speaks to the character of the leader who is willing to go out of their way, not just for the crowd, for the high steeple cathedral, and the catering constituency of the few. Listen, money, fame, and fortune is not found in the few. Glory is not found in the few. Accolades won't come to those who go out of their way for the few. Will your leadership be strong enough to reach the one who is farthest away and bring them home? Everybody wants a crowd, and having a crowd isn't a bad thing. But when you believe that success is only having a crowd in two locations, Jesus asked the question, which one of you? Being the leader brings with it a responsibility to do something of significance that make people families, community, and churches make the life better and make it work better. As Coos and Posner puts it, it's not about how big a campfire you build for yourself or for your crowd or how well you kept others, but how well you kept others warm who lingered on the fringes of your campfire. How well you illuminated the night to make everyone feel safe and how beautiful you left the campsite for the preacher who's coming behind you to build another fire. Which one of you is willing to go out of their way to retrieve the stray that went away, who doesn't deserve a search party in the first place, whose track record is not worthy of retrieval strategies, whose contribution to society is negligent or non-existent, Which one of you is willing to go out of their way for the one who has been a drain on your resources and your patience, for the one who always takes and never gives in return, to the one who consistently, when they think about it, only puts a dollar in the offering plate when they come to church? Take a deep breath. Which one of you is willing to go and bring them back at your own expense? Which one of you is willing to go and pattern your leadership after Jesus 
and go in unpopular directions. Which one of you is willing to go and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit even when he takes you beyond your comfort zone? Which one of you what? Which one of you is willing to go the extra mile to retrieve people and things of value that have been misplaced in the 21st century? Which one of you is willing to go out of your way to bring back those who haven't earned and do not deserve a second chance? And finally, which one of you is willing to go on? This speaks of the perseverance of the leader. In the last parable, the father had to go on when the prodigal son went away. He was disappointed, but he had to go on. He was disillusioned, but he had to go on. This was not how things were supposed to work out, but he had to go on. Barbara Brown Taylor defines disillusion as the loss of illusion that we have about ourselves, about our world, our God, our family, our friends, our church, and our country. She says it's like living in fantasy land and no one is amused anymore. She writes when disillusion, while disillusion is painful, it's not a bad thing to lose the lies we have mistaken for truth. Jesus asks, which one of you will go on when you lose the illusionment of what this thing is all about? Which one of you is willing to go on when the road gets tough? Which one of you is willing to go on when things don't go according to plan? Which one of you is willing to go on when he walks out, when she won't speak to you no more, when the divorce is final, when the baby dies, when the prognosis is poor? Which one of you is willing to go on? When no bell has been set, uh, when you got baby mama drama, uh, which one of you is willing to go on? When the budget is cut, uh, your department is phased out, uh, there is no pay raise from your officers, uh, oh, there's a storm cloud on your horizon, uh, the bottom falls out, uh, your savings dries up, uh, the transition to a new ministry fails, uh, and just when you think uh, you can't take not one more thing, uh, one more thing happens. Which one of you is willing to go on? When life costs you more than you have to pay, which one of you is willing to go on in spite of what it costs you? Cost your mind, cost your spirit, cost your emotion, cost you financially. Which one of you is willing to go on when the dis family joins your church? Mr. and Mrs. Dissatisfaction and their children disappointment, discontent and distress and their great grandchildren disenchantment and disease join your church. Are you willing to go on? Are you willing to go ye therefore and teach all nations and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Are you willing to go on and stir up the gifts that are within you? Are you willing to go to hard and remote places to preach to the few because the many are not showing up? Are you willing to go on and be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because your labor won't be in vain? Are you willing to go on? Jesus asks the question, which one of you is willing to go the extra mile? Which one of you is willing to go on in spite of disappointments? Because our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in God. A Christ who is infinite above our finite human ways. 
our confidence is in a God who is interested in how we do this thing, the what and the why of it, so that we can go on to fulfill its promise in spite of its perils and its passion. Jesus asked the leaders who gathered around him that day, which one of you, which gives me an opportunity to ask you the same question, so that when you do take your final exam, because your final exam was not in this institution. Your final exam will be given by the congregations that you serve, the ministries that you lead, the students that you teach. That is when your exam will be given. And you will hear the question brought to your heart by the Holy Spirit. Which one of you? Now, you have to make the decision. It's me. Here are my Lord. Send me.